Good morning. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, I appreciate it. We had some difficulties with the train system coming out of New York, uh, so we welcome all questions about mass transit. Um, <laughs> my name is Ben Dworkin. I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. On behalf of Ryder University and the Rebovich Institute, I want to thank all of you for coming to be a part of this unique and special program. Before I introduce our guests of honor, let me just explain what's gonna happen. First, we're gonna have, ask everyone, please turn off your cell phones. We want to try and avoid any kind of uh, needless interruptions. Second of all, please note that today's program is on the record. It's being recorded by both Ryder University and Cablevision, where it will be seen uh, sometime in the future. It's gonna be on our website, so please be aware of that. Third, uh, as you saw when you came in, copies of the governor's book are here and can be purchased in the lobby. Following the joint program, you can get it autographed, copy upstairs in the fireside lounge, just follow the signs as you leave the auditorium. In a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to the governors and then they will begin their conversation. Uh, about, we'll give about 25 minutes, we're running behind, uh, about 25 minutes or so, I will come back up here uh, to indicate that we'll have about 15 minutes to do a Q&A. We have several wireless microphones held by volunteers uh, who will pass one to you if I select you. Please wait until you actually have the microphone before you ask your question. I also ask that you make your question as succinct as possible just so that we can get through as many as possible. That having been said, as a public event here at Ryder University, the first three questions are gonna be asked by Ryder students. So everybody else, you're gonna have to wait uh, and see if we have time after that. The Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics is committed to, in part, raising the level of political discourse in our nation. This means that we continue to bring in an array of political leaders and elected officials and public servants to talk about the challenges facing our communities, our states, and our nation. Today's event builds on this strong legacy. Each of our guests today is a star in his own right. They are leaders in their states and in the nation. When each of these men speaks, people pay attention, and rightfully so, for the future of the Republican Party, as well as our nation, is being impacted by the leadership of these two gentlemen. We would be honored to have just either of them here on stage, but together, they are the dynamic duo. We are really something special. <laughs> It makes me Batman over here. Sorry. That's it. In an, in an era of dysfunctional Washington, D.C., the laboratories for the future of government continue to be in the states. It is in the states where we see the cutting edge of public policy being made. And each of these men is at the forefront of pushing that agenda. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the great state of Indiana, Governor Mitch Daniels, from the great state of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie. Gentlemen. Well. Ben, thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, you know, as a, as a guy who just got elected in 2009 and came in as one of the, the rookie governors, and uh, Daniels was, was one of the uh, senior statesmen. The fact that I now get to ask him questions is great. <laughs> this is great. Uh, we did a, we've done a lot of this privately over time. He's given me a lot of tutorials over, over my 20 months as governor, so now we get to do some of it publicly. Welcome to New Jersey. I'm glad to be back on this campus. You yeah. know, last time I was here, I was attending a then all meal school nearby and trying to get lucky. <laughs> 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 I'm hoping, I'm hoping today works out a little better. Why don't you tell them? What? <laughs> we'll do the best we can for you. Um, this is Jersey, after all. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, um, why, why, don't you, why don't you just tell them a little bit about your New Jersey background, because you do have some. Well, I went to school here for, uh, for four years. That uh, well, left an indelible mark on me. I, get, I come back now and then and reunite with my ne'er-do-well classmates. But... Uh, you know, hit, back then you could hitchhike. I, I saw an awful lot of New Jersey from its highways. Uh, it was right before the hitchhiking era closed, I guess, in America. <laughs> and I got around it on the cheap a, long, a lot of times. Uh, speaking on the cheap, uh, talk, 
I think first about, you know, you're obviously, you're, you're known in Indiana for what you did um, in terms of taking over the state in some real difficult financial circumstances and, and how you dealt with it both in ways where you reduce government and innovative ways to try to fund things. So um, I, I think talk to folks a little bit about what you found when you became governor yeah. and then how you kind of proceeded from there, what your philosophy was, how you approached it. First, I'll say that uh, although we, we found the challenge pretty large one, I don't think it uh, rivaled the, the one you found here. And, and you know, just uh, at least from everything I've been able to hear and read, uh, it makes us, it made me uh, count our blessings that our, uh, our issues weren't uh, any bigger than they were. But they were big. It was interesting. Indiana was uh, out of cycle. This was, we came in in 2005, and the bubble was inflated, and the economy was doing well, and most states were doing all right, and we were, we were uh, broke. Um, and um, it didn't take a lot of magic. We brought the level of state spending growth down to compounded over seven years around 1%, so maybe a third of inflation. And for the first few years, revenues caught up. People ask, how'd you do it? I, I always say something wise, like the, 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 the flip, like, uh, you know, we spent less money than we took in. You know? <laughs> like, uh, write that down. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I guess the thing I, that I would say, uh, Chris, is that uh, uh, the reason I think we've been able to sustain a position of fiscal solvency, even in a really severe downturn, we got hit as hard as anybody at the revenue line, yeah. um, is that uh, I, th I think it's fair to say we built a culture of performance in Indiana State government, starting right away. Uh, we pay people for their performance. The best performers in state government have had, some of them had double digit pay increases year after year on year. The other end of the bell curve, people get no worries but a chance to do better, one chance to do better. Uh, we measure everything. And the, I guess the larger point I want to make is that, that uh, our approach has been to say, look, um, we should never take a dollar from a free citizen uh, without a really necessary purpose. And, we, and there were a number of things we decided these things are not necessary. But there are many, many Im imperative roles government should have. And uh, so within that, we may draw a, a slightly smaller circle than some would of the things you ought to do, but in that circle, we work really, really hard to deliver effective government, not just because it's an, uh, it's an equally important obligation, give people uh, good service for the money you do take, but uh, another point that I, it's on my mind more and more these days is that we want, we want the people of our state to have confidence in government. Skepticism about big governments is American as you know, the Coney dog, <laughs> but Folks, and a lot of folks who agree with you and me about basic things, I think so, let, let that skepticism uh, uh, migrate into contempt, contempt for all government. And I don't think that's a good thing in our democracy, and it's sure not a good thing when we're facing huge problems yep. that, that effective government alone can solve. Well, it's interesting. We just went through, a, um, as you know, a big round of, of pension and health benefit reforms mm -hmm. for our public sector. Now, you had gone through that already on the health benefit side in particular yeah. in, in Indiana. Um, and I always thought it was interesting, we've talked about this before, but I think it's interesting for this audience to hear, Chris, which is at the beginning of this process. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the way you changed the provision of health insurance and health care yeah. for your public employees and how they responded to it and what the effect has been? Because I think it's an interesting story. Yes, we, uh, when I first uh, arrived, uh, some nice person came in and, uh, and I said, hey, you have to sign up for the benefits and the health. And I said, okay, is there an HSA or something like it? And, and they said, no. I said, well, uh, when can we fix that? And they said, the end of the year for next year. I said, well, let's put one on the menu. We did, and to go to the end of the tape, uh, uh, we now have 86% uh, uh, of, of uh, Indiana's state employees, uh, I should say remaining state employees. We have fewer state employees than, than Indiana had in 1976. But uh, those, those who remain are doing a great job, and 86% of them have what's called a consumer-driven account. I guess everybody knows what I'm talking about, but in this, uh, uh, in one of these arrangements, uh, the employee uh, contributes, the employer, that's the state, contributes, and that's their money. And they decide and pay cash uh, as long as there's money in that account. Anything left at the end of the year rolls over. There's $50 million in these accounts, uh, 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 last I checked. That's the property of the person. Uh, then they're covered in true insurance fashion on the back end. Well, guess what? Um, People are, are not too uh, gullible, uh, too uh, 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 incompetent to make healthcare decisions for themselves. And now we've got a body of evidence that shows that 
in very, with huge deltas, they are more likely to ask for generic drugs. They're more likely to ask for second opinions. They're less likely to go to the emergency room. Um, they shop around if there's a, if there's a procedure that uh, they do have to have. And we are saving double digits. The last actuarial report was 11 or 12 percent, um, everything normalized, below what you would get in an old, you know, traditional plan. And uh, so we think that's, I always say we'll never have cost control in healthcare care until we're all cost controllers. You know, when the government's trying to squeeze it here and squeeze it there, you know, the balloon pops out somewhere else. And uh, the last thing I want to say, uh, Chris, as I think you know, is we applied this same principle to our program for the low-income uninsured. And so these are people just above the Medicaid line who are not eligible for Medicaid. And uh, guess what? They're showing a lot of savvy, too. <laughs> and they're making the same consumerist decisions because uh, it doesn't feel like it's free. It doesn't feel like somebody else is picking up the tab here. You know, we're kind of, for the scholars in the room, we're kind of the only test bed out there. It turns out that the average penetration of consumerist plans in public sector America is two. I said, well, heck, we got to be 0.5 of the two. <laughs> but why? Because the union paid them. You know, right. they, they want to stand between the, the, that poor worker and the, and the system. But uh, uh, our folks have proven in those two populations, you know, Americans are up to this. Uh, we ought to give them a little more credit. And, and I, the thing I thought was fascinating was that you, it's free choice yep. for these folks, and 86% of them yep. choose to go into these health savings accounts rather than the traditional well, it's a lot insurance plans. Well, it's a lot better deal. Because it's costing less, we've been able to charge less for it. And um, it's very much in our interest as the employer to incentivize, and we have uh, these plans. We're charging more like the real cost of the very expensive plan. And our folks believe we'll be over 90% when the upcoming enrollment period's over. Amazing. To take you back to a different time in your career and how it affected your conduct as governor, you mm -hmm. had stints in two different White Houses. Yeah. Um, I think, or was it three? Two. Two, I thought it was the Reagan White House, right? And then two, there's one too many, but two. <laughs> yeah. And then as OMB director for, for uh, yeah. George W. Bush. I mean, how did those experiences in Washington then um, affect your approach and, uh, as governor of Indiana when you left there to become governor? Less than some people suspect. It may, it may have uh, helped uh, fortify a uh, conviction I think I already had that, that uh, government's a pretty klutzy mechanism, and, and, you know, and you ought to be very modest and humble about assuming it can do anything well. Um, you know, it, if, if you'll permit me, Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll say, as I've often said in the past, because a lot of people assume, they kind of look at this rather you know, strange list of things I've uh, been involved in, they center in on those. Yep. But by a huge margin, it, it, when I'm asked what job that you've had helped you be a, a, in your current role most, oh, it's the years I spent in business, no question. Um, uh, how to make ends meet, um, especially when things are tough. How to find ways, to, how, to, how to identify those things that separate the must-do from the nice-to-do items. How to get large numbers of people headed in the same direction. Uh, as I was talking about earlier, you know, you and I can do the make the smartest decisions we know how and maybe get the legislature to help on here or there. But if you really want government to become leaner and more effective, you, you got to get everybody, as many people as possible in the act. So when, when, I, when something seems to go well and I think, well, how do I know that? It's almost always from running a, 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 a modest-sized business or being part of a big business, big uh, corporation. Uh, now we look at what's going on in Washington, and you alluded to this. Ben alluded to it in his introduction. Um, how do you view the current atmosphere and climate in, in Washington, and, and, and what's your view from Indianapolis about what should be being done there to try yeah. to make things a little different? Well, not too pretty. Um, you know, but I, uh, uh, because uh, optimism is the only operating assumption I know that makes any sense, I, I look uh, on, I'll answer your question, and I try to write this book uh, from a, um, with a positive outlook. I mean, there is no uh, doubt in my mind that, that the results we need, the young people here and on this campus and all their counterparts elsewhere um, are going to get a, a serious hosing, <laughs> along with the rest of us, by the way, if we don't get serious about the debts we've piled up as a country. That is not an ideological statement. It's an arithmetic one. And, um, and I think progress toward that has not, let's just say, has not been helped by the currency of debate in Washington. I wrote it. 
chapter about this. Um, I can identify some positive things. They're talking about the right subjects now. You've had the bold Simpson Commission. The president ignored it, but it was, but, you know, it advanced the discussion. And, um, uh, but boy, you know, it, progress has been so halting and so slow. You've proved in New Jersey, and we've tried to, I think we've got some evidence in Indiana. Boy, you, if you've got a big problem, get, uh, get after it. Yeah. Yeah? There's a country in Western song I always like called, if, I shot, if I'd shot you when I should have, I'd be out of jail by now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, pull the trigger. And, uh, and um, so, um, you know, I hope I'm wrong, but there's a whole, there are people more knowledgeable than I that, that agree that the arithmetic of our national situation, let's don't worry about whose fault it was. Everybody had a hand for a long, long time. The question ought to be, as it always is, what do we do now? And I do think that all the sort of sound bites so's your old man stuff, uh, is, is slowing that down. Uh, 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 this is so important, I'm going to take one more second. Yeah. You know, uh, people ask about the presidential race and so forth. Um, I'll tell you something's troubling me a little bit lately. I think the president's in really bad shape. I think the failures of his policies and uh, maybe other factors, uh, uh, you know, will mean he'll have a difficult time getting reelected from what I can see right now. What troubles me about it is, it could lead, if that doesn't change, it could lead whoever gets nominated on our side to p want to play it safe. Yep. I'll be the default option. You know, vote for me, I'm not him. Yep. Well, I do think we need to change national leadership. But if you think that we face a survival level issue as a country and that uh, uh, we need big change now, we found, I know you found, big change requires big majorities. You gotta try to get together people who might agree on, even if it's just one thing, they may yeah. disagree about everything else. Okay, fine. But uh, I, I hope our nominee, and there's lots of time for this, will have a little more confidence in the American people. Step out and not only identify the problems, but say, look, here's my best cut at how we solve them. By the way, if you've got a, a better alternative that really will work, let's hear it. But you know, don't elect me unless you really are prepared to see uh, something major change. And I, you know, I think uh, it's, it's the contention of this book, despite all the skeptics of the centuries and of the present day, that we can do this. And, and you, the concern I have as well, I, I share what you have, is that we're not really talking about on our side, any of the folks are at this right. point, those issues in a really forthright way. We're kind of we're dancing on some other stuff around yeah. and everyone's trying to they get their four or five sound bites that they prep for before the debate and we'll see that again tonight I'm yeah. sure uh, but you know what you'll I, see it yeah I don't watch those things <laughs> <laughs> call me up and tell me what I watch it I watch it for you and Haley and uh, I, you. I call yeah, you guys you. and let you know what, it, what they said but it, it it seems to me that that we have a we have a challenge as the folks who are, who are not involved in it um, to be kind and prodding people into, into talking about these things yeah. because they're so important to the future of our states and what we're right. trying to do. And um, I wonder what you see as your role in, in the national discussion going forward. We know you're not going to be a candidate for right. president, but what do, you, what do you see as your role going forward? Well, we'll see. You know, I, I, I wrote this little thing. I don't know if anybody's going to read it, but I, that, was my, that was my whole thought. I'll tell you the true story. The idea of writing it, uh, uh, I took seriously starting, oh, 20 some months ago. And they said, uh, you write up an outline, we'll give it to somebody, see if anybody's interested. I was very proud of the first line of the outline, was so many books are written because the author intends to run for president of the United States. This one's written specifically because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm concerned about the country, and let me tell you why. I thought, well, that's catchy, that's a grabber. They made me take that out when, we, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when they went to sell the book. But, uh, uh, but I didn't con anybody, I said, no, I. I don't think it's in the cards for, for me and for my family, but, uh, but I, we all have an obligation to participate, and so that could be a part of it. And obviously, if there's something useful I can do to help our eventual nominee, I will sure be willing to do it. Well, I'll ask you one other thing that's particular to both of our states, um, and then we'll open it up to let other people uh, ask questions. Uh -huh. um, there was an attempt here by my predecessor, as you probably know, to, um, to uh, sell our, our toll roads. Um, the, the turnpike um, and the parkway, mm -hmm. um, and which turned out to be unsuccessful both in terms of achieving it and drastically unsuccessful politically mm -hmm. uh, for him, which is why I'm sitting here with you and not him, uh, at least in part. <laughs> um, but um, 
but I know you went through that in Indiana and yeah. found some very different results. And I wonder if you could just talk about that and, yeah. and what it's allowed you to be able to do um, in Indiana because of the way you handled it. And if you know a little bit about the differences mm -hmm. between what happened here and, and in Indiana, you could probably talk about that too, I'm sure. All right, well, let me try to be uh, real concise, but it's a, it's a big story uh, it's in the book, by the way. Um, <laughs> let me start by saying this is one of those issues I've always thought in my naivete that folks across the spectrum could get together on. You know, we do need to rebuild the infrastructure of this country, uh, the, the asphalt kind and the uh, fiber uh, and frequency kind, too, for that matter. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, our predecessors in our party, the Whigs, Abraham Lincoln, so they really believed in internal improvements. It was the, why? Because uh, uh, this is something that, if government does it well, it enables the private sector to flourish. Yep. You can build your business on one of those new roads and be closer to your markets and what, so forth. So um, we had the same problem that almost every state, every state I know of has, huge shortfall uh, between promises politicians had made. I'd go around the state when I was a no-name first-time candidate. People had these yellow pieces of paper. You know, the state commits to build Highway 69. It was 40 years old. So anyway, <laughs> we couldn't find any other way to raise the necessary money to close this gap or even approach it. Uh, I look around the world. I see this happening everywhere but the United States. We offered to see anybody want to lease and run our toll roads effectively as a public utility, <coughs> tightly regulated, by the way, a couple hundred pages, controlling everything from the, any growth in tolls to uh, how long you have to get snow off the road. And um, we got, the uh, timing was fortunate. We moved fast, helped a lot. We hit the jackpot. I was telling uh, Ben in the other room, uh, you valued that road in state hands, in political hands, patronage operation, uh, I got to take this digression. I used to, I was traveling all over the state all the time. Again, nobody knew who I was, and I tried to do it with shoe leather. And we kept going through this last toll booth for Chicago. It's 15 cents, one five. You know, like, who, hell, who's got a nickel, right? I mean, <laughs> and I, I, I got elected. I thought, that's 15 cents. I said, what does it cost us to collect the toll? Plus government. They don't know. <laughs> so I said, I said, well, Go figure it out. They come back in a couple weeks, they say, we think it's 34 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's a great business model. <laughs> I said, but I got a better one. Close the toll booth, fire somebody's cousin who's sitting there, you know, and put out a, a cigar box, <laughs> right? We're 19 cents ahead, and occasionally somebody will chuck in a quarter just to be nice. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we, got, we got three times the... Uh, I said, value the road as though all future governors will be all, unlike all our predecessors. They will raise tolls with inflation just to keep the thing going. It was losing money. And uh, what's it worth? And the NPV of that was, uh, you know, a billion three or something like that. We, I said, you know, we're going to have to get a couple times that before I'm going to go through this. We got three times that. And the rest is history. We're building it at record rates. The, the, our, our construction budget in Indiana this year is three times the historic run rate. And that's a great time to be building stuff, by the way, because there's nobody else is, yeah. and we're getting great prices. So long way of saying that uh, it worked for us. It uh, may not work everywhere else. I, I remember talking to Governor Corzine uh, briefly about it, and he, he was reluctant to go the, the full lease route, and he, I know he, he came up with something more complicated, which I don't recall the details of. I will just Nobody say, else does either. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm sure you found the same thing. I've, I've discovered, learned over time, simplicity really matters. When you try mm -hmm. to do something big, when yeah. we went to do, do property tax reduction and so forth, we looked at a lot of things that were, I said, the problem with that, that's smart, but you're not going to be able to explain that to any, yeah. you know, to the, to the guy in the diner. And, uh, and so um, uh, ours, it was controversial first, but I'll tell you the lessons that came out of it. One, um, again, back to, to trust and confidence. Uh, if you, at least the Americans that I'm employed by, <coughs> six and a half million of them, they, uh, uh, they will listen to a new idea. And we are not a state that's been known historically for change, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're willing to listen to a new idea. And uh, if you make an honest enough case, plain, and plain spoken case, a lot of them will support it. Some that don't, or don't get it the first time, they're open-minded enough, they see a result later mm -hmm. on, they say, well, you know mm -hmm. what? Maybe it's okay. And so uh, uh, I really hope that uh, we'll start addressing as a nation this 
Very real problem. Another one we ought to come together on. And part of the answer ought to be to do what the rest of the world's doing. Let private capital participate. The problem is, if you go down to Washington, you're you know, full of goodwill and tell this story, and they, at least before, and they would look at you going, no, 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 no. We want everybody to come here and kiss our ring for the money. We don't want those nasty private enterprises to have anything to do with it. <laughs> well, I, I think we should allow it to get open up some questions from the audience. Very uh, good. And uh, for the governor, so. Sure, yeah, go okay, thank you, governors. All right, well, we have, like I said, the first few questions are gonna come from Ryder's students. Uh, so let me turn to our front row, Michael Ward. Uh, you got a question, so if we can get our wireless mic to him. Governor Christie, Governor Daniels, I first of all want to thank you for coming to uh, Rider University thank and sharing a few moments with us. Uh, I'm a Rider freshman here, and um, the first part of my question is to you, Governor Christie. Uh, prior to your victory of signing into law pension and benefit reform, many public sector unions in the state unleashed ad campaigns that left a sour taste in the mouths of many unionized public school employees. Governor Daniels, I'm sure you've met some of the same problems as well. Uh, do both of you feel that you'll need to repair this relationship with teachers and their unions before, conti before continuing with comprehensive education reform? Well, I mean, so for me, I I'm willing to repair a relationship that's willing to be productive. You know, I mean, I could go there and act, you know. Listen, I could pretend as well as the next guy, you know, so I could go there and pretend that everything's fine and, and you know, we'll be nice to each other. And, and, but my position regarding the teachers union has been the same from the time I got into the race until today. That is, when they're ready to come forward and be participants in meaningful reform that will improve especially urban educational opportunities for our kids, um, then I'm willing to sit at the table with them anytime. They want to continue to pass uh, on to me warmed over protections of a failed status quo, then they can continue to stand outside my office and look in the window. And that's my view on it. And I think that people should know what the, the, the status of the relationship is. I shouldn't pretend that it's okay if it's not. It's not. And if you think it is, then you don't watch TV because, you know, <laughs> they spent about 15 million bucks over the last 20 months to let you all know that I don't belong in the governorship. I got belong in jail or something. So, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's my view of it. But I'm sure, I'm sure Daniel's much more uh, congenial on that than I am, maybe. Yeah, I wouldn't say jail. <laughs> <laughs> maybe probation. <laughs> no, I mean, one of the things that, you all know this, but you know, America uh, loves your governor. And, uh, and, and, and part of it is just because his, his sincere concern, if the issue is education, for instance, his, his first and last concern is children. And uh, he doesn't let anything else get in the way. You know, I'm for good relationships. I really am. I, I, I'm out always preaching. We've tried every way we can to, as I say, build big majorities. But uh, you, if results is what you, can, you, you care about, that, that's what you do. But if, but there has to be a two-way street. And uh, we just passed the most sweeping set. We, we ran the table on education reform this year. But it could never, ever, ever have happened until the political equation changed. I tried everything in the world. And we did a lot. We did, uh, you know, uh, as many things as we could to make the teachers, the individual teachers, uh, a life and, and, and career better in our state. We immunized them against uh, lawsuits if, they keep, if they're keeping order in the classroom. And uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the fairest, the, the least fair system was all the one we had. The best teacher, no matter how effective, no matter how hardworking, got no, nothing any better than the worst. Now, you know, people say, um, uh, annual evaluations and uh, tenure based on student growth, not tenure based on living another year. You know, oh, it won't be perfectly fair. I say, no, it won't, life isn't. But it'll be a lot more fair than what we were doing. And you know, I think the best teachers agree with that. And uh, any day that our teachers union wants to really jump in and, and, and get with programs like that, uh, I'd love nothing more. But you know we couldn't wait. America's waited way too long. We have we have handicapped a generation or two, at least in some in some uh, sectors of America, uh, for life. And uh, the constant stalling tactics and rear guard actions, you know, just uh, can't wait. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Charles Measley.
Governor Christie, Governor Daniels, uh, my name is Charles Measley, and on behalf of the Ryder College Republicans, I'd like to welcome you oh, both here today. Right. I was wondering why you're wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> a red one, too. Red tie. I thought maybe you had to wear a tie to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question is directed to the both of you. Uh, with unemployment among college grads being the highest it has been in recent years, what state regulations need to be eliminated in order to spur job creation? Mm. Well, um, I hope fewer than there were six years ago in our state. <laughs> I don't know what Chris thinks. Um, uh, th this is a very important question, and I think it's very much should be on our minds nationally right now. I mean, uh, uh, Charles, the uh, uh, this, this enormous survival level issue I keep talking about uh, can, uh, of our debt can only be addressed if we have a period of rousing national growth. Uh, again, it ought to be something everybody agrees on. Um, most important, of course, for the youngest people uh, in our society and for the poorest. And uh, a, a big part of that is to stop making it more expensive to hire people. And regulations do, almost always. Now, sometimes that is fully worth the price and the candle, but in the situation we're in now, uh, I personally favor um, a, uh, uh, a moratorium, or at least one with a severe exceptions policy, uh, on, uh, on anything new for a while, while we try to create uh, or help the market uh, create uh, more opportunities for the people you, you're asking about. You know, on my first day on the job, we tried to be real busy, and we were, um, but one of, the, one of the things I did, the only, I, I went and got our, you know, room a lot bigger than this, uh, all the employees of our environmental management agency. And uh, uh, there were a lot of them there. Uh, they're not as many today, but there were a lot of them there. And I, and I said, uh, listen, I want you to understand what we are and aren't about. Uh, we are not going to moderate or weaken one uh, regulation in seven years we haven't. You know, we're proud of the progress that's been achieved and frankly some Folks on my side of the tracks ought to acknowledge that more often. However, um, uh, we got an economic problem in this state. And those folks out there you're regulating are not the enemy. They're your neighbors. And uh, I want you to do three things, please. One, I want you to be quick. Time is money is not a figure of speech. We're going to measure how long it takes you to turn around an answer, turn around a permit. And we do. Two, I want you to be predictable. Keep bumping in these folks, says Inspector A said one thing, I spent the money, Inspector B came around six months later, told me, no, 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 do something different. So, you know, you're killing people, you're killing, you're killing jobs when you do that. And I said, finally, I want you to be collaborative, not punitive. Your job is not to lurk around, you know, in the bushes waiting for somebody to screw up so you can come out and whack them. Uh, your job is tell them what we expect. Tell them how to get to compliance. The few bad actors that don't, we'll throw the book at them. At them. So that's our approach. And, and um, you know, people calculate. Here's one thing I did learn in that last job, you know. Mm -hmm. You can calculate with real precision the tax that a regulation imposes. It's, it's quantifiable. And it's big. It's huge. A couple trillion a year in, this, in the country right now. And uh, so sorry for the long answer, but it's a really important question. It's got to be part of... <coughs> Uh, the recovery, not just of our two states, but the nation. I couldn't answer any better than that. Go to the next question. Okay, L we got time for one last question, though. Jonathan Josephs. Governor Christie, Governor Daniels, thank you both for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I understand this choice must have been both political and personal for both of you. Why have you guys chosen not to run for the 2012 presidential election? Well. Which one of us said no first? <laughs> Who goes first? Do it alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he went to Princeton. Um, <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> listen, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right in the premise of your question, that it is, um, it is a personal judgment at the end. You know, I'm sure both of us um, have had lots of political experts and interested parties and genuinely good Americans come to us and suggest that we should do this. But in the end, um, I said this to a number of folks who approached me. I said, you know, I appreciate all the wonderful things you're saying about me, but when I'm in a hotel room in uh, Des Moines and it's uh, 5.30 in the morning and it's uh, 15 below 
and it's time for me to get up to go shake hands at the meatpacking plant. Um, the only one that's going to be in bed with me is Mary Pat, not you. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to be out there on my own. And uh, you all will be back here in New York or Washington or wherever you're from, you know, warming your bed, sleeping, you know, while I'm out there doing that. So it's got to be something that you and your family really believes is not only the right thing to do, but I think what you must do at that time in your life, both for you and for your country. And for me, the, the answer to that was it isn't. And, and if you don't feel that, you know, deeply in your heart that it is, then you have no business asking, bunny, asking anybody for their money or their vote. Uh, and that's why I said, you know, no. Well, Jonathan, uh, first thing I want to say is that um, I'm not taking no from Christy. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm taking not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, he, uh, uh, he's, he's newer at this business. He's got a lot of, he's doing so many good things for your state. And, you're, you know, your state needs him to keep on. And, uh, and, and I respect completely, uh, although I think it would be, be a great thing, but I, I respect completely. Uh, and, you know, in, in, in my situation, uh, quick story, uh, uh, I always did um, uh, the, the, my, my own speeches and, and even commercials, you know, in the campaign. I always thought uh, as often as possible, if I would speak for myself and if, if I'd written it or figured it out myself, it, it would come, people would understand I meant it. And so the very last one, a, a year out, I knew what the last message of the second campaign would be. So I stood in some, on a town square somewhere, I said it. Whatever your outlook on politics, I've got some really good news. This is the last time you'll have to watch me in, a can in an ad like this. <laughs> and I went on and said, you know, that we'd like to be rehired, and we had some big plans and so forth. And um, that was, and, and, and then ultimately was, my point of view. I had never had aspired to uh, elected office before, and I didn't, I don't, didn't aspire to it then or, or after. Um, uh, it is, as Chris said, uh, you know, it, it, if you finally begin to entertain what originally is just a surrealistic notion, you know, me, you know, um, then um, uh, there are a lot of other factors involved. The way we conduct politics these days, pretty savage business. I could have gone with that, but you know, this is not a decision at that level. This is not a decision you make for yourself alone. And there are five women in my family, and they are a formidable force. <laughs> <laughs> on the day, uh, on the day I uh, said uh, finally I'm not doing it, uh, I said. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in the Daniels Family Constitution, the Women's Caucus has a veto, and there's no override provision. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and as we said earlier, there are other, other ways to contribute, and, and never forget the, the uh, saying, I think it was de Gaulle, the cemeteries are full of indispensable men. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just refuse to believe that, certainly, that, that, that I was. But that doesn't mean you don't have an obligation if you <coughs> can do a little good or... Uh, have a little say, um, provide a little help, and feel very obligated to do that. But in, uh, in, the, in our case, in our family, uh, that, that won't be as candid. And, and, and I'll just add one other thing. I, I think the interesting thing to note about this going forward in terms of the, 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 the requests that have been made of both me and Mitch um, is that the, we've been predominantly talking about the same things in you know, maybe different language but the same type of problem that we're identifying um, for our country's future. And so, I, you know, from, from my perspective, if there's lots of people clamoring for us to do this, then I don't know why candidates like the president and others in my party, our party, haven't figured out mm -hmm. that that's why. I mean, look at the two of us. It is not our good looks up here, okay, <laughs> that they're clamoring for. They're not saying there's a spot open on Mount Rushmore yeah, and, oh, man, yeah, yeah. these are the guys for it. I think it's because of our ideas. It's because of what we have chosen to emphasize as governors. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that should, I hope, and I trust that it would have happened already, and if it did, it would get a lot of pressure off me and him, mm -hmm. um, that, that people would understand that and start talking about it. And if they started talking about it, I think they underestimated. We talked about this when we saw each other backstage, and I think it's a good place for us to finish, mm -hmm. is that I think that politicians on the national stage underestimate the American people in both parties. 
and they think that you're unwilling to hear hard truths. They think you don't recognize that our country is in crisis, and that means that everybody's going to have to sacrifice some things that they otherwise wouldn't want to sacrifice. And I think what the country is thirsting for more than anything else right now is someone of stature and credibility to look them in the eye and tell them that and say, and here's where I want us to go to deal with this crisis. And the fact that nobody yet who's running for president, in my view, has done that effectively is why you continue to hear people ask Daniels if he'll reconsider and ask me if I'll reconsider. Mm -hmm. If other people were dealing with this, I think they would just leave us be to run our states and let us do what we need to do. So, um, so part of it is, I think, our ideas, but part of it also, candidly, is the, is the failure of the president, predominantly, since we only have one of them at a time, and then some of the other candidates on, on our side of the ledger from really dealing head on with this issue and speaking in plain English to folks. And I think that's why Mitch and I have gotten along as well as we have since I joined the, the group, is that uh, you know I watched him in Indiana and, and knew that a lot of the things that he was doing were things that I aspired to do here. And I could point to what happened in Indiana and say, see, it can be done. It can be done. He did it. He did it with the people who supported him, with the group he put together. And uh, so that's why when I heard he was uh, in the neighborhood, I thought it would be good to spend some time together. And I appreciate Ryder putting this together for us. Thank you very much. Thank Amen. you. Ladies and gentlemen, the dynamic duo. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we were great to do that. Right. Yeah, no, please, remember, please remember there are books to be sold outside. Governor Daniels will stay around to sign. Governor Christie has to leave right now. On behalf of Ryder University and the Rebovich Institute, thank you. Have a safe trip home. <laughs>